All right, well, uh, I'll start off also by uh, thanking the organizers for inviting me to be here with you all today. It's a real privilege uh, both to share the stage with these remarkable individuals, but also to share this space with you and to offer you some of my thoughts and ideas on some of the problems that we're talking about today. I want to admit also that when Ryan first asked me about um, speaking here tonight, I actually hesitated and I suggested actually that you all should be hearing from uh, Dr. David Boyd. I don't know if some of you have heard of him. He's sort of a, one of our top environmental law scholars in Canada right now. And he's actually recently written a book which tackles this subject, I think, in a very comprehensive way. And I told him that I would plug it for him tonight, um, Cleaner, Greener and Healthier. Uh, he was actually in town a couple months ago uh, talking about this book. But it so happens that uh, David lives in BC, and he couldn't be here tonight, and I, I know this because I asked him. And, uh, and, and it also turns out, though, that a big part of his book talks about um, ecosystem services and the roles that ecosystems functioning and healthy ecosystems play in contributing to human health and well-being. And that's something that I've actually spent a fair amount of time talking or thinking about, talking maybe too much, but at least thinking about a bit. Um, and so that's what really I'm going to be talking about tonight. So, so three things that I hope to do tonight, and, and hopefully it'll work out. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, explain a little bit, what do I mean when I say ecosystem services. And in that context, I hope to unpackage and, and, and demonstrate the relationship between ecosystem services and human health and well-being. And then think a little bit about what it means to have an environmental law, whether at the federal, provincial, and especially maybe at the municipal level, that, that incorporates and reflects the value of ecosystem services. And everything that I'm going to say, I think, one, one additional sort of caveat before we get started is that all of the benefits that I'm going to talk about, I think, you know, maybe with some exception, are more difficult to enjoy the lower our socioeconomic status is. So that's something that we want to think about as well when we're thinking about policy in this context. So the starting premise, the starting idea of ecosystem services is that the environment can be conceived of as a form of capital. You think of it like a factory. Factories make widgets. In law school, we love widgets. Um, so the environment then is like a factory that produces services. Um, and we define these sort of in the literature as the direct and indir indirect contributions to human well-being. And we're going to get into some of the, I'm going to get into some of the more theory on that in a second. But I actually find that this concept is easier to explain by illustration. So what you have is a map here of New York. In 1996-1997, the United States Environmental Protection Agency decided that they were going to ramp up the stringency of their regulations under the Clean Water Act. And New York was faced with a choice. They suddenly found themselves uh, staring down a $6 billion investment in additional water treatment infrastructure, which would also be tied with uh, roughly hundreds of thousands millions of dollars in operating costs to, to operate that infrastructure. Or they could look north to their watershed. And that's what they did. They looked up to the Catskills watershed which had been in fact providing them with water all along, but the watershed had become degraded. And what they figured out is that for a fraction of the cost, $1 billion versus six, if they just invested that money in restoring that watershed, they would get the same water quality standards. And so in a sense, the, water, the Catskills watershed was a natural water factory, right? And it provided that, that, that service of clean water for, for, for New York. And so we're flying into Europe right now because, partly because I needed to use more of this map, um, but also because, and wrongly, I always associate the United Nations with Europe. Um, and I know that's not right, but in any event, around this time, you know, around 1997, this notion of ecosystem services really took off. And by, nine, by 2005, it's adopted as a sort of formal framework for the United Nations Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. This was sort of the first global assessment of ecosystem health. And that report reported rather grimly that two-thirds of the Earth's ecosystems were in decline, and that we needed to, and that countries needed to make, pass laws and, and adopt policies that recognized what they called the true value of nature. And so a few years after that, we had a subsequent effort that was sort of intended to develop and refine these concepts, and that's this economics of uh, ecosystems and biodiversity. And, and so I promise I'm not going to get too far into the theory, but it's useful, I think, at this point to unpackage this idea a little bit is, is to recognize what we talk about when we say there are four categories, four broad categories of ecosystem services. And so the first one is provisioning services. These are some of the most intuitive, I think, food, right? So fish in the sea that we consume, that's a provisioning service provided by functioning ecosystems, right? If we gum up the oceans, as we're doing right now, 
that ecosystem service is not going to work the way it has been. It's not going to provide us those benefits. Raw materials for construction, wood, um, fresh water, the New York example, near and dear, I think, maybe to this group, right? Medicinal resources. You know, tradition, whether it's traditional medicine or the, or the sort of the raw ingredients for many pharmaceuticals, we get these ingredients in nature. They are the product of functioning ecosystems. We have also regulating services. These are things like climate regulation, right? Storing CO2 by the boreal forest. Moderation of extreme events. We know about extreme events, right? Here in Calgary, we had a massive flood two years ago. Wetlands are, provide and moderate flooding, right? They, they act like sponges. They have some water, but they can absorb a lot more. Um, and so we need to start thinking about these services when we're thinking about land use planning, right? When we talk about forestry or mining activity or, or off-road use, we are inevitably causing and undermining some of these services. And, and then we have the result that we saw in Calgary in 2013 where too much water came too quickly, right? Another service, another category supporting services or habitat services, I won't spend too much on time on those. But then the last one that I also think, again, is very relevant to this context is what we refer to as cultural services. And so this is the value and the services, you know, the, the benefits we get from environments when we're out there in the wilderness, when we're, you know, whether it's hiking or biking or canoeing. Um, we can talk about aesthetic appreciation, inspiration, you know, and there's a wealth of studies that demonstrate the, both the physical and mental, well, mental health well-being benefits of spending time outside, spending time in nature, right? And so if, if by now you're sort of thinking, sorry, I'm going to send you back and forth. Um, well, sort of like this is like, you know, old wine and new skins, right? I mean, yeah, we knew this stuff before too. I mean, we've known for a long time that the environment provides us some of these things. But the idea here is that in our modern society, actually, you know, it's, it's actually easy to forget that food doesn't actually just arrive or come from the grocery store or that water doesn't just come out of a tap, right? But that it has an origin and that origin is in functioning but increasingly degraded ecosystems out there. And, and when we start to think about these and account for these services, we notice that they are incredibly valuable. And so a study in 2009 of the McKenzie region found that that area provided services to the tune of $570 billion per year. And most of that was in, term, in terms of climatic regulation, right, the absorption of CO2. A subsequent study in 2010 in the lower mainland of British Columbia estimated around 5.4 billion for just 10 services, right? So it wasn't a comprehensive, the number would be higher if we were to count for everything. And the big, one of the main sort of contributions there was wetlands and the role of wetlands in absorbing the excess nutrients, phosphorus, uh, you know, that came from fertilizer and agricultural activity in the Fraser Valley, right? And so these wetlands were absorbing that excess and ensuring then that the water that subsequently made its way down to Vancouver was still of, of, of some reasonable quality. All right, so what does all this mean for environmental law? So the key thing here to understand, um, and you're just gonna have to take my word for it, it's a longer, it's, it's a whole other lecture, but at the end of the day, when we think about environmental laws, what you wanna think of is a decision-making process. Very few of our environmental laws in Canada, US, and, and in, in any kind of modern society impose substantive limits no-go zones. They're, those are very rare. For the most part, what we have is uh, some kind of regulatory framework that says you need to ask for this and a government decision maker has to make a decision. And what we try to do with environmental law is we try to structure that decision making in a way that favors positive environmental outcomes or at the very least minimizes negative ones. And when you see it that way, when you see you know, when environmental law as a decision making process, I think the potential role of ecosystem services becomes very clear you're going to make better decisions. You're going to account more fully for the, prob for the, you know, the costs and the benefits of any given action and for the trade-offs that are being made in that context. And so the first thing you need to do, obviously, to implement that kind of thing, right, and that kind of decision-making is to take stock of your ecosystem services. And I'm happy to say that actually this is a bit of a good news story in Alberta. We have done and we have seen a lot of great work, um, in particular by the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute. And so if you're bored tonight and, and you're having a drink and you want to Google ecosystem services assessment, because of course that's what you want to do, um, then you're going to find a whole bunch of really wonderful material that talks about the services in Alberta and the work that's being done to further take stock of those. We need to also start thinking about and establishing a bit of a track record of taking those things into account. 
And on this front too, I think there's reason to be somewhat optimistic in Alberta. We have seen in the context of, for instance, the 2013 flood and the mitigation discussions afterwards, we have seen the role of ecosystem services come up to prominence. And so initially it was all about the mega projects, right? We were gonna build massive dams, everybody wanted them right away because everybody was freaked out. But then over time, people said, wait a minute, there are natural, there are ways to do this without building massive dry land reservoirs. And it looks like we're still going to have some kind of dry land reservoir, but it's being attenuated and it's being supplemented and complemented with investment in natural flood and, and flood protection. So we're starting to see some progress in that context and I think that's great. So then in Calgary specifically, you know, I, it sounds maybe a, it's a bit of a generalization, but I think one thing that we could do very quickly is to start really insisting that when we're making decisions at the land use planning scale, that we start thinking about ecosystem services, that we start taking them into account um, and if we can even quantify them, all the better, right? And in some respects, I think, again, we're doing not bad in Calgary. We have green spaces in Calgary. We have, Glen, you know, the park around Glenmore. We have Noah's Hill Park. We have an incredible system, or be getting better all the time, bike system, bike trail system, which allow people to benefit from these services, right, to enjoy some of these services. But then we have also some, some, some parts of the record are spotty, right? I mean, Calgary has massive sprawl issues. And part of that is because we have undervalued the, the ecosystems and the land types that were essentially developed, right? And so we need to think about how do we discourage that? And, and again, I think that in the last few years, we have seen policies in that direction. There are a few other sort of, you know, things that are being tested out. This has been a long time, in a sense, we've been talking about ecosystem services for 20 years. Um, so I'm not gonna, I don't wanna get into the minutia of that, but I think that this is something that we need to start talking about. And then I think, again, in the context of what Ryan said and, and the discussion here tonight, to recognize that all of these things are harder the lower you are in, in terms of socioeconomic status. It is harder to access green spaces um, in that context. And in fact, it's, you know, there's a whole area of environmental law, environmental justice, which is preoccupied with the disproportionate burden uh, that people in lower socioeconomic um, uh, ranks um, suffer in terms of pollution. And, and then the, that's another lecture as well. So I'm gonna leave it off at there. And uh, thanks again to the organizers for having me.